Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our presenters who are joining us tonight and bringing their expertise to us tonight. I think it's going to be a really fascinating discussion that we have for you all. Uh, so in this bonus presentation of the History Speaker Series, History and Art are coming together to discuss fur trade. Um, our two speakers bring varying perspectives to the matter and we will be touching again more on their credentials in a moment. Um, before we move ahead, I have a couple thank yous. Firstly to Phil Jackman, who designed our, uh, our poster. He did the, the vast, vast majority of our uh, media design and he's incredibly talented. Um, and thank you to Marianne Grant, without whom this presentation would not be what it is. So uh, thank you, Marianne, for all of the hard work that you put into this, uh, making this evening as smooth and professional as it is. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Tanya, who is going to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Hello everybody, my name is Tanya Cunnington. I am the Arts Programming Coordinator of the Aurel Museum of Art and History, and I am also the curator of Jill Price's exhibition, Unfurled, Unsettling the Archive from a More Than Human Perspective. So I'm going to introduce Jill, and I know that Jill is going to go into more depth about her exhibition, um, so I'll be quite brief about this. Unfurled is an exhibition that speculates on how animals might choose to engage with, frame, label, and question material objects held within the archives of museums. Unfurled utilizes objects and materials held within OMA's historical collection, as well as original <laughs> archives. Jill Price is an artist, educator, and social scientist, and research council scholar, grateful to be living and working in traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe peoples in Barrie, Ontario. Uh, Price attained a BFA and a BED at Western University and an MFA in interdisciplinary art, media, and design from outside the Are you guys getting an echo? I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't think that's yes. Trying to fix that. Okay, can everybody hear okay though? Should I just keep going? Is that all right? Okay, awesome. Um, now a PhD candidate in cultural studies at Queen's University. Price is currently investigating her role as a white settler artist in times of truth and reconciliation. Price is also exploring unmaking as a creative act that helps to disrupt colonial and capitalist perspectives, practices, and presentations of land. And again, Jill will talk so much more about that, but I did want to give a brief introduction to her. And I'd like to throw it back to Lindsay now to introduce John Savage. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I first met John a few months ago when I interviewed him about his ancestor, who will be coming up shortly, in advance of an exhibition on immigration that we have starting soon at OMA. And I was awed by John's enthusiasm for history, for genealogy, and by his willingness to share all of those stories with the museum. And I couldn't wait to get him involved in another museum project, so here we are. Uh, John is a descendant of Aurelia's first settler family of fur traders, the Gadors. Uh, he is a librarian and an amateur historian who has worked with the museum in the past as a co-curator of the exhibit, Minjikening, Mapping the Life of the Gadors. He currently works with an initiative that promotes the revitalization of Indigenous trails, portages, and paddling routes in Canada. We're thrilled and honored that John was willing to join us tonight to share his expertise. So John, thank you so much again for being here with us tonight. I'm now going to give it back to Tanya for a land acknowledgement. Yes. So before we begin, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people. The Anishinaabe include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples. 
So I would like to start now with the questions. I'm going to start with Jill. And like I said, I give such a brief, brief introduction to you there, Jill. Um, can you please tell us a little bit more about your exhibition, Unfurled, Unsettling the Archive from a more than human perspective and what led you to this exploration? Jill Price, everybody. You can see my screen okay? Yep. Great. Okay, so thanks for coming this evening on a beautiful summer night. Tanya actually did a really great job of sort of introducing the overall concept of the show. So just sort of talk to you about these slides. Um, within the exhibition Unfurled, uh, I tapped into the museum's collection of old photographs, furniture, sculptures, and other object material objects of material wealth to point to how the fur trade worked to furnish the homes and line the pockets of European industrialists, while simultaneously leading to the death, displacement, and depression of furry and four-legged creatures. Um, both Lindsay and Tanya were very helpful in sort of accessing and pulling out different fur items from the collection. And as you can see on the right, they were the fur and skulls are placed intermittently all around um, the galleries and even attached to the wallpaper to point to how our interior and exterior environments are materially and psychically linked. Here you can see um, an installation shot, a part of my installation that aims to recreate a Victorian parlor and how fur has been used to activate every surface. Uh, and yeah, on the left is one of the small drawings that was used to create the wallpaper in the back. And that's been created from drawings of woodland animals that were part of the fur trade. So how this uh, exhibition came about, uh, Nanette, your director Nanette Girodi actually finished, visited my studio after completing my MFA at OCAD. And, during which my research investigated the shadows of the global textile industry. And during this research into the economic and ecological justices of fast fashion, I had received a Michael Smith foreign study research bursary to uh, travel the early textile trade routes in Europe. As one might suspect, these paths eventually all led back to the Atlantic Ocean and pointed to explorers and then traders crossing the ocean to North America or at Turtle Island's furs, lumber, and land were seen as rich resources for colonial Europe upon which to expand their reign and grow their wealth. My brief look into the North Atlantic fur trade uh, revealed how early peaceful trade between indigenous communities and the French soon devolved into extreme violence. Um, and then upon, as, uh, as more colonial European countries arrived and competed for territories and their rich resources. So what you're looking at here is an installation shot from my thesis exhibition entitled Material Shadows, in which I hung three crafters fur coats of beaver, rabbit, and raccoon that had previously been dipped into a graphite bath, pounded out on paper, and then dragged to create the prints on the paper below them. The processes used in creating this work served to point to the violence and force needed to beat an animal as well as drag or haul carcasses across the land. I saw the prints created during the process as traces of that violence and how trauma lingers and persists behind initial acts and sets of violence. Uh, as a result of revealing so much trauma um, related to the global text in textile industry and how it continues today through corporate forms of neocolonialism, I began to wonder how I could begin to unmake myself from systems, materials, and imagery that perpetuates or carries forward trauma. Although not at first intending to work with fur for my exhibition at OMA, it was researched into Aurelia's history as an important route and meeting place during the early years of the fur trade that pointed to fur significance and strength as a material to revisit and redress the Euro-human-centric telling of Canada's history, while also drawing attention to the anthropocentric perspective and practices still carried out today. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Jill. Uh, and I cannot wait, and I'm sure this is true for Tanya too, we cannot wait to have you all in the building to be able to see Jill's incredible uh, e e exhibit that she has on right now. So John, uh, your family history dates back to the fur trade. 
Can you tell us about Antoine and Nevananaquet and their importance to Aurelia history, please? Okay, well, uh, let's start with Nevananaquet. Uh, Nevananaquet's uh, name translated as Summer Cloud, which is quite a beautiful name. And he became known as uh, Chief Big Shilling later on. And we think he got his name because he used to, uh, some people thought might have worn one of these peace medals which is a, a fashion accoutrement. We'll talk about that later, but it's got a picture of King George III, which is the same design as a shilling. And it's a bit larger than what a shilling would have been. So on one side, it's the King, king and then on the other side is a coat of arms. These were given out uh, in recognition of uh, favors done or for services provided to chiefs. Now, he was part of uh, the Deer Clan, and uh, which is now the uh, Chippewas of Grandma. So he was a chief under Chief Yellowhead. Chief Yellowhead was the Grand Chief for the district uh, that covered uh, potentially as far, you know, from Toronto all the way as far as Sudbury. Um, uh, now the exact boundaries, I'm not absolutely sure. But what happened was, uh, we'll, we'll get into this with my next topic, which is the first trade history, but they sort of fit in uh, as the Chippewas, as uh, suppliers to perhaps the Wendat that used to live here, the Huron people who were middlemen in the fur trade and supplying uh, uh, France with, with furs. And uh, so what would be required of them would be to uh, trap beaver and to, uh, and to uh, uh, make available their, their stores of used beaver, like used beaver was actually the prize because if you wore the beaver for a year, the guard hairs would fall out, the fur, the undercoat would be, uh, develop a nice luster with your body sweat and, uh, and, and it would be prime for the, uh, the market there. And, uh, and the best beaver would be the, uh, the winter greasy beaver as they called it. So this would be a, a beaver harvested in the winter time and then worn for a year and then traded through the Wendat to the French. Um, so they would have they would have been trading with the Wendat, but when the Wendat eventually uh, were uh, dispossessed of this area through, uh, through uh, uh, pestilence and with the attacks by the Iroquois in 1649, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Chippewas started moving in here. And eventually in the, uh, I believe it was the 16, 90s, late uh, 1680s, there was uh, a battle for Southern Ontario where the overlap between the Iroquois and the, uh, and the Ojibwe peoples uh, brought them into conflict uh, over the, these, these grounds, perhaps for the fur trading uh, or for the harvest of furs, but also for um, just hunting in general. So uh, they ended up settling here. Uh, there may have there's some accounts in oral tradition that there was a large battle in Aurelia and uh, there was certainly uh, evidence that uh, there was some sort of conflict in the area through pictographs as well. And uh, so at the time, uh, which this would have brought us up to the uh, early 1800s, the, uh, they would have been trading with uh, Courier de Bois and uh, perhaps even the Northwest Company, according to my cousin, Mike Mulvihill, uh, he says there was uh, on Garnet Island at the south end of Lake Kuchiching, there was a fur trade post that the Northwest Company operated. So that still has to be verified. So if there's any historians out there that can verify that, that would be really interesting uh, to know that. So he would have, uh, when he, he was 17 years, or yeah. So the issue for the Chippewas, as with many of them at that time, was that these Courier de Bois and the uh, and, and the Northwest Company uh, had the capacity at times to man manipulate the pricing uh, prices of these pelts and they could uh, the, to their disadvantage. And so it was to their advantage uh, in a mutually ex uh, convenient way that uh, if they could integrate a fur trader into their f extended family, they could what they call today shorten the uh, supply chain. And uh, this would, uh, allow them to cut out the middleman by marrying marrying the middleman into their extended family and their and their fur supply operations, which would have extended at least to uh, uh, Heronia and possibly all the way north to Sudbury. 
So anyway, along comes Antoine Godor. He fought in the War of 1812 as a 17-year-old uh, voyager who was on his return trip to Montreal from, uh, from Lakehead and uh, at the north end of uh, Lake Superior, which is now Thunder Bay. He was enlisted by um, Captain uh, uh, Charles Roberts, along with uh, the Drummond Island Métis and other voyagers and Ojibwe and other First Nations to fight against the Americans in the first battle of uh, 1812 that the, that the uh, British side won. And this is very important because that solidified the border between uh, what would become Canada and the United States, but more importantly to the fur trading companies in that area, the, the Northwest Company and even the Hudson Bay Company, it meant that the American fur company could not encroach upon their territory. And uh, so Antoine, when he was 20, he ended up in Aurelia. He uh, ended up in a relationship with Mary Schilling, Chief Big Schilling's daughter. And they had a son, Antoine Jr. And then they had a subsequent son, uh, Francis Godor, uh, reported to be in a wigwam on what's now Smith Bay, which is the piece of land between Moose Beach and Smith Bay there. And uh, which is, so today, Tidehope Park, most of it, where we have the festival, uh, that is their former homestead. So it's stretching from Moose Beach to where the Aurelia Rowing Club dock put in is. They operated a farm and they are recognized as, as Aurelia's first settler family. Interesting note, Mary ended up in the, uh, in, in the Pioneer Cemetery and Antoine ended up, we believe, in the Rama Cemetery. So they straddled both worlds together and uh, their little fur trading post was conveniently located where people would portage between the two lakes. After Mary passed away, Antoine uh, moved to Rama to Fawn Bay, where he re continued his fur trading operation with his sons, who were known to operate one of the biggest and wealthiest uh, uh, operations around. Now, one of the things about uh, Indigenous society is that they were integrated as we think they were, this wealth would probably have been shared with extended family because uh, Indigenous people back then, that's how they demonstrated their wealth was uh, by sharing it with their, with their uh, community members and demonstrating generosity. And this would elevate their status. Hoarding and, uh, and, and stockpiling uh, wealth was not something seen as desirable. And that was more of what the Europeans brought to North America as a value. So anyway, that's that's our um, family history on the fur trading. The fur trade operation eventually succumbed or declined with the fur trade itself. And uh, I, I probably am in the last fur trader in our, in our family because uh, I recently bought some uh, bear skins and wolf skins on, on, uh, online, found out they smelled too much of mothballs, sold them the next day. Uh, for a little more money and made a profit off it. So I can add that to my resume now too. Thank you, John. Um, I know this is a loaded question for the five minutes that we've allowed for it, but can you give everybody a quick history of the fur trade and how it got started in Canada? Okay, well, the fur trade, it's, it's important to note that there's, uh, there's, there's different elements of the fur trade. First of all, there's beaver. We have lots of beaver and they, uh, they reproduce uh, incredibly. We have indigenous people that have hunted furs for thousands of years and, uh, and worn them and know how to treat them. And we also have a consumer base, which was Europe. And in Europe, in medieval times, they got most of their furs from the Baltic region. But by the time, uh, by the 17th or 16th century, these fur resources were uh, becoming scarcer there. And and the Baltic countries were becoming less reliable. And uh, so when they started noticing that Basque fishermen and English fishermen and French fishermen were coming back with furs from North America, there was uh, an interest in, in establishing a trade. And, and this trade originally started with the fact that the Basque fishermen probably were looking for something warm to wear. And so they would trade uh, little things like tools, practical items, and that the French and the English, unlike the uh, Spanish and the Basque who had access to lots of salt to store their fish, they would have to dry their fish on land. So through the interactions with people on land, 
uh, they would start doing a small little trading as well and bring that back. But the big commercial operation really didn't start till later till Samuel Champlain showed up after um, uh, uh, the explorer Jacques Cartier to uh, set up the uh, first fur trading uh, uh, alliances with the, the Wendat, the Innu and the Algonquin peoples. And, uh, and it's important to know the Wendat were Iroquoian and the, uh, and, and the other two were uh, from the Algonquian uh, language group. And, uh, but they got together and in 1609, they, had a, they came up with a, a treaty to work together. And, uh, and to solidify that agreement, they went and attacked the Iroquois, um, which uh, is kind of an odd way to say, let's get on with business and attack the next guy. So that led to a battle with the Iroquois that lasted uh, a century or more and uh, lots of uh, uh, attacks on both sides. Eventually the, uh, the Wendat, uh, who were great middlemen, uh, they succumbed to a pestilence and, and Iroquois raids. And then of course the, uh, the fur trade moved on. Um, the, uh, now, there was also the rise of corporate fur trading. So you, you get these different French companies that were started up and uh, they, uh, they, they, were, they could help to manipulate prices as well. At one point, there is such a glut of uh, fur that their warehouse in, in, uh, in France uh, uh, was just so stockpiled that they wanted to discourage fur trading. So they started licensing fur traders. So what, what we ended up having was voyageurs who are licensed fur traders or working in the fur trade and then courier de bois, which were unlicensed fur traders and middlemen. So you had um, the young men who were brought to New France to farm. All of a sudden they would leave their farms to go into the fur trade because that was much wealthier. Plus there was access to women uh, out in the, in the woods because there were very few women in New France at that time. And, uh, and, and, and so it seemed to make sense for them. Later, uh, the, the British uh, got involved with the Iroquois in trading after the Dutch uh, were um, moved on from upstate New York. And the British also decided in 1670 to um, create the Hudson Bay Company, which is still around today. And uh, that became competition with the French. Eventually when New France fell to the Brit British, Scottish, Fur traders, uh, you know, primarily from the states, moved to Montreal and they set up the Northwest Company, and uh, that that competed with the Hudson Bay in their own wet watershed at times, and they extended the fur uh, trade or the fur trapping territory further and further inland uh, as the stock as the stocks were depleted and the hunting grounds were depleted. So what you see is this this creeping from the St. Lawrence Valley of a fur trade network that went north, west, uh, south, and, 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 and southwest throughout all North America. The, and and for, for a while, it looked like New France was gonna be you know, North America, but by defeating them in Quebec, the British knew that they could have the, get everything. So you cut, you cut the goose off at the head and you, you, you get the whole, the whole goose. Um, so what we see today is this network which then becomes the map of what is Canada. And, uh, and then with the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company, they eventually merged together. Uh, and, uh, and then this, which was a fashion trend, came to an end in the, uh, towards the 1850s. It had a steep decline after Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's uh, uh, consort, uh, was showed up at a public function one day and uh, wearing a silk top hat, which was cheaper, and now the new fashion. And that spread throughout Europe, and that was the decline of, of beaver fur felt hats. So anyway, I won't get into the beaver felt. We'll talk about that a bit later on in this. Yeah, we certainly will. Thank you, John. Uh, so Jill, back to you. Can you please talk about what the fur trade looks like today? Sure, I'll just share my screen again. So from this picture, you can see that there's still uh, a very active international fur trade today. 
with Canada actually still being one of four major countries involved with wild trapping and one of many countries still operating fur farms despite many countries already banning them. Uh, Austria, Belgium, United Kingdom, uh, Northern Ireland, um, Czech, they, these are all countries that have disbanded their fur, fur, fur farms and Netherlands is in the, uh, is preparation, preparing to rid all of their mink farms by 2024. Uh, on the left, we're actually looking at 150,000 square foot warehouse facility near the Toronto airport that houses the headquarters of North America fur auctions. It is the largest farm fur auction in North America, but also the most extensive wild fur auction in the world. Formed after the divestment of Hudson Bay's fur sales, the auction house traces its founding to the same year the HBC was chartered. Um, so in Canada, approximately 700,000 animals are being trapped and hunted in the wild annually. And this actually only accounts for 30% of the furs that go to market every year, operated under provincial and territorial legislation and national codes of practice covering animal welfare developed by the National Farm Animal Care Council. 70% uh, of Canada's fur market is actually due to fur farms. Some of or some people, many people argue, which are less humane than wild trapping and hunting simply due to animals being born in captivity. Those who study animal behavior suggest that being caged and in such proximity to one another goes against animal basic instincts such as digging, roaming, swimming, diving, and living in isolation. Many animal rights groups such as the Humane Society and the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals have reported that their confinement and close quarters beyond leading to alarmingly loud and unsanitary environments plagued with disease, parasites, infections, and toxic smells also leads to other signs of distress include self-harm, pacing, circling, and fighting with cage mates. This last year, actually, we all became witness to how disease is rampant in these environments when fur farms across the globe tested positive for COVID-19 and then took extreme measures to prevent any further spread of the virus. So, just move this out of the way here so people can read that. Oh, sorry, I've got all my little windows up. <laughs> so here's actually a, a a picture of just a glimpse of the seven million um, minks that were killed in, in Denmark in November in 2020, um, which they are actually now digging up because their bodies have um, the gases released from their body are, create, are forcing the, their carcasses back up to the surface and then running off and contaminating um, spaces that people live in or and play in. So it, it's quite a horrific um, event that's going on there. So the other one of the other arguments about fur farms currently today is that uh, they limit the economic opportunities of Indigenous people and other independent trappers in remote areas as they flood the market. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs joined the BC SBCA and other advocates calling for a moratorium on mink um, and uh, mink farming in the province, and they support, however, they do support the eth ethical harvesting of fur for cultural and ceremonial purposes and for purposes that align with Indigenous ways and respect values of conservation and stewardship. So there's just a little glimpse. I think we're going to talk about activism later, later in the, in the talk. Thank you for that, Jill. Um, my next question is to you both. Uh, can you please talk about how the fur trade affected the environment from a settler, indigenous and animal perspective? And I think I'll throw that one to you first, John, if that's all right. Okay, well, first I, I think locally, um, as, as the area became over hunted, uh, we find that uh, the supply of beaver diminished, the supply of deer diminished, moose, and, um, and so by the 1830s, it was quite obvious that uh, the uh, Chippewas in the area, there, it wasn't very, uh, 
the, the land base wasn't supporting them as well. Now, one of the byproducts of, of over hunting uh, to supply furs is that you hunt less big game as well for a while. So, you know, there, there were periods when uh, different groups would, uh, if they're not hunting enough big game, they didn't stockpile the, enough food for the winter so you could have famine, for example, uh, if the weather turned bad. There's also more effects of pestilence, you know, like in, uh, diseases coming from the Europeans to the trade um, with them. And then in, in Huronia, we find depleted hunting grounds. So in the 1830s, uh, my other ancestor, uh, Jacob Gill, came up from the States to build the uh, cold water mill. And that was uh, an economic development project uh, for the Chippewas to learn to, uh, to, to use the land in a, in a different way. So to try and get more out of less, less land, reduce their, their footprint, I suppose, in terms of having to hunt and gather over extended uh, territory distances and try and you know, fit into the settler economy. And uh, which, which there was some indication there was interest. Um, you can look in the historical records and you can hear uh, the words of the chiefs of the time, including Chief Big Schilling and Yellowhead, uh, that they were concerned that their people wanted to participate in this new economy and that they could see the clear advantages of participating as a farmer, for example, versus being a successful hunter. And there's one speech I remember where the, the chief was talking about one of their one of his uh, band members was uh, one of the best hunters in the in the region, and yet, you know, he, all he had was a broken pot as his wealth, and could barely support himself because the the, the hunting grounds were diminishing. And so, uh, but within a year of this fellow taking up farming, you know, uh, he had a a barn, he had livestock, he had uh, a cart and a horse, and he had acquire new wealth. So it's almost like uh, today when there's some new industry that's starting up, you get these champions trying to promote it. And uh, so back then it was seen, yes, okay, the Europeans are showing us how to get more out of this small piece of land. Uh, let's try this out. So that's one thing you can see there. And then I remember the story of my great, my, my, of, uh, of my grandfather's talking about how he, my great grandfather called him down to the, uh, to the Aurelia Opera House where the, the, the city hall is today and the butcher shop across the street where the tunnels used to run, um, you know, for those wild parties in the 1930s. Well, anyway, they had this uh, big moose hanging there from the tree. And that was, um, according to Charles Goodor, uh, my great grandfather, he said to Joe, I, that may be the, the last uh, moose you'll see, ever see in this region because they were diminishing so much at that time. I guess that at that period it was past the fur trade, but it was the logging period and at, with habitat destruction, um, you know, there was expected to be no more wildlife that they could catch like that. So anyway, that's that's an example. And, uh, you know, and we, and we continue, continue to see how it had an effect on the land. You know, it, it is interesting with Ducks Unlimited how important beaver are to their operations. They, they do a lot of work serving beaver ponds to try and see how they're, you know, what state they're in because they recognize the, how the, there needs to be an ecological balance and that beaver are very important to supporting the rest of the ecosystem. And uh, for that reason, uh, even though be, they say there's more beaver today than there was even before the fur trade, because uh, they bounced back. There was a time when we had to have special reserves for beaver where they were protected uh, from hunting and, uh, and, uh, and, and for uh, their habitat. So anyway, that's, that's how I see it. No, thank you for that, John. That was great. So Jill, the same question to you. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about how the fur trade affected the environment from a settler, indigenous and animal, definitely animal perspective? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to even try to uh, speak on half of the indigenous community. And I wasn't a settler. And so I wasn't a first settler. And so again, I'm not going to try and um, speculate on the complexity of that. But uh, as animals don't have a voice, I took the, this uh, question as an opportunity to speculate on it, what the animals 
or specifically beaver might have been experiencing during this time. And I just, again, I just like to make um, a, a warning that uh, this is more of a narrative a story from the from the perspective of a beaver. And so there will be uh, reference to um, mass killing of creatures, as well as uh, pointing to sort of the eco and cultural genocide that happens today. So just if, if you're sensitive, I, you, I, yeah. <laughs> It's important to be sensitive, but I just wanted to give you a warning. I'm just gonna make that smaller. I'm trying to get rid of my thing. There we go. Oh. Okay. Me and my remaining relatives have been greatly affected by huge changes to our environment. Often watching from the rooms of our lodges, we can see our children, lovers, co-workers, and other fur-bearing animals dying in vast numbers. These deaths are not due to old age, dietary needs of other four-legged creatures, or caused by a sick brought on by creatures smaller than ourselves, but carried out more aggressively by the two-legged beings we once knew, the worst of who uses the cries of our young to draw out their parents. These sightings of horror are only made worse by the squeals and silence preemptive and following each blow. Our captors, although still sounding the same and walking the same, appear to work alongside others of their kind to wear our flesh differently. With more of our coats worn on the outside rather than on the in, we often mistake one of our siblings or soulmates being carried off alive. These paler uprights also sound different. Beyond their utterances rolling off their tongues and lips with new emphasis, tone, and pitch, they often bellow to and over those who we have heard here before. These new beginnings also bring with, or these new beings also bring with them different types of sticks. The longer ones, without much notice at all, let off loud booms of smoke and release hard spherical subjects that kill my kin with the swiftness of wind. Their explosive, these explosive mo moments also trigger this area's feathered and four-footed inhabitants to take flight mid-nap or mid-meal away from their dens and nests. The sticks that come down onto our bodies, although shiny and weak at first glance, produce more deadly strikes and stabs than those which laid our ancestors to rest in the past. When not in use, they clank in pouches and against the strangers' bodies. These noises are often deafened by the creaking, moaning, and crashing of the wooden tall ones onto the forest floor, where they are further hacked, hollowed, and delimbed with the same tools that draw our blood. When dragged away from their resting places, they leave paths across ours that often create confusion and anxiety for our remaining young. This stress is heightened by watching our food and shelter float away from us in our waters. Those who have tried to stay with the beings that sustain us have nearly been crushed by the speed and numbers which which they travel away from their homeland. Beyond their departure, disturbing many of the communication networks they are a part of, their departure has left holes in the canopy that sustains so many of us below. I have been told by some of the day dwellers that the leaves of young saplings curl up and die from the rays in the sky each day. This new level of exposure has also required us to abandon many of our feeding grounds that have dried up, not only as a result of the heat that comes from above, but also due to the destruction of our dams and dens that keep the marshes fed. But it is not only us, the trees and the wetlands that are disappearing, whether buried, burned, or left to feed the carnivorous, there are both quiet and loud events taking the lives of those who work alongside us and those who have turned against us. Their sickness, blood, and decay has soured the earth and waters upon which we feed and drink. Even while still alive, their sweat and increasing number of fires in these parts give off a toxic sweetness we have not smelled before. This and our extreme personal losses have greatly affected those of us left behind. We have lost our laugh, we have lost our appetites, which has left us overall with an overall aching weakness that makes us fearful of not being able to rebuild our homes in time for winter, 
or ensure we will be able to rejuvenate our numbers after the thaw. This is even made more difficult as many of us seed carriers have lost our lifelong mates and so must wait for more females to be born. Even more problematic is that the remaining bearers of children also, in, also weak and depressed from the loss of their young show no signs of willingness to produce more offspring knowing what awaits them. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so this question to you both again. The fur trade was a massive economy. Can you please discuss the economic impact, both positive and negative, of the fur trade? And John, we'll start with you, please. Okay, so I'll start with the positive. Even though it was very negative in many ways, the positive <laughs> thing is by following the beaver deeper and deeper into North America, uh, that, that brought uh, greater exploration, and uh, which Chief Big Schilling apparently was involved with as well. I just learned from my distant cousin again that, uh, that he was, uh, there are reports that he was hired by the British Navy to help in exploration, perhaps with the Franklin uh, Expedition uh, search party um, going through the lakehead. So, um, so there was exploration, there was mineral discoveries, there was uh, logging uh, track discoveries, there was discovery of the country and its, and its potential. And that led to transportation systems being set up to access those. So at one point there was seemed to be railways going in all different directions uh, to access these resources. Some of them went to no man's land and didn't really tap into anything. And that was just a, sometimes some initial public offering that scam that they were trying to do for some of the railways. It became a bit of a headache politically because you know we're still dealing with the fallout from railways going in all directions because the government had to bail them out as well. So there's that sort of negative side there. But by and large, it was it was very positive economically. The relationships between uh, for 250 years, the relationships between Indigenous people and the uh, and the Europeans was fairly positive. Uh, there were way more Indigenous people than there were Europeans. So the fur trade wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for Indigenous people in the, uh, being employed through this. Uh, and they allowed to uh, allowed for enculturation, which is the sharing of knowledge. So what we find is that Indigenous people uh, may have taken on some of the economic traits of Europeans, uh, but the Europeans may have also taken on some of the positive traits of the Indigenous people. And the positive traits being that uh, to maintain relationships, to constantly uh, renew those relationships under with with uh, reinforcements, uh, gifts, uh, acknowledgments, uh, consultation, bottom up, um, uh, de democratic uh, um, uh, governance, uh, and and also commerce based on meritocracy on, on merit rather than just entitlement. Uh, some of these, the, the consultation crept into our system politically. So that also has had an effect on developing our economy because the more uh, de democratic our system is, the more uh, consumer groups and, uh, and, and other uh, rights groups can participate in that economy. Uh, so in this way, that was very, very positive. It was very unlike uh, colonial Europe or the European uh, system. Uh, which was uh, which was very uh, structured and hierarchical. So uh, that that's one thing that's very positive. The um, the uh, there are some negative aspects. I'll get into that later. Um, but I would say too the fact that this network extended across the continent also meant that all these different groups that were um, indigenous nations uh, were then working together in this one system. If let's say Canada was founded on a mining trade or different patchworks of different resource extraction, would we even have would we even have the boundaries that we have today that facilitates trade? We might be broken in, up at, like Europe into different groups, different language groups even. 
And that could be a hindrance to the economy of what became Canada within North America. Wonderful, thank you, John. And now Jill, back to you, same question. Please discuss the economic impact, both positive and negative of the fur trade. Thank you. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, John's did a great job to sort of um, already review how the uh, fur trade chain looked in terms of who was actually making the money, who was doing the labor and who was doing the money. Um, and obviously it's going to be uh, difficult to find any benefits of um, economics for the beaver or for, for animals themselves. Um, and, and if we think from a standard of economic gain or growth, um, you know, that obviously the animals aren't, aren't included in that, that formula. So to discuss economic benefits from an animal perspective, we would really need to shift our understanding of economy to look at the word ecology, Earth's first iteration of an economy where all things are part of a gigantic interconnected and therefore interdependent mesh of material. Um, there's a natural order that although cyclical is designed to keep everything in check and balance, um, some humans more than others have greatly disrupted that plentiful and sustainable economic system where animals, plants, water, air, and soil have value and always have for something to the well-being of others. The only incident that might be considered as a form of remuneration or giving back to animals really came at the brink of their extinction uh, was the outlaw of hunting of certain species and the establishment of national park system said to ensure the protection of their natural habitats. But this is a completely another contentious history talk um, for the future around the national park system. Um, but I, I, I have come across some really interesting uh, documents um, about uh, the economy and equating it to animal life. Um, so this, what you're looking at here is the example of a made beaver trade in for tokens. So the, the beavers would be stretched, um, cleaned, dried, um, and these would be exchanged for the tokens that would then be used um, to buy other items with. And uh, Every, and all animals were based on this system. The beaver was the, the, was the animal that determined all other work, which is, un, which is really fascinating. Anyway, um, these tokens evolved and were issued by the Hudson Bay Company in the 1800s. And they were stamped with the HBC crest on one side and with the letters HB on the other side. And um, here, <laughs> Um, you can see East Main District is below HB and made beaver is the denomination of, of one made beaver, a half made beaver, or a quarter made beaver. So here we have a quarter made beaver, even an eighth made beaver. And these, uh, the value is determined on the size of the pelt as well as the type of pelt. So for example, one rabbit might be eighth of a, a, um, a made beaver. And the fascinating thing about this coin is it's uh, stamped with an NB, but due to error by, it, that's supposed to be an MB, made beaver. So that was actually the first coin. Um, it was an error by the die cutter. So it's kind of funny. Um, during my research, I also found several documents in which I wondered what an animal would think if they truly understand that their loved one was traded in for some thread or a pair of socks. Uh, drawn from historical documents. On the left, you can see the amount of made beavers needed to purchase different items, um, items whose worth and value was determined by human European systems of capitalism, not, you know, obviously the animal didn't determine what it was worth. And on the right is one of my works entitled Fur Trader, Fur Traitor, in which a beaver looks up at a rich European furnished in fur with his paws out asking, what do I get in return? Um, blinded by the material excess of his hat and desire for the accumulation of wealth and power, uh, the, the uh, European man feels no obligation to give anything in return or arrest the harm in which he has acquired his riches and possessions. 
Uh, and then this chart I found fascinating uh, as this established a very different type of hierarchy within the animal world than that was established by the natural order of the food chain. So during the height of the early fur trade, two, world, two wolves were seen as the same value as one beaver and one large bear would only be val valued equal to two beavers. I think most shocking to me was that it took the lives of four coyotes or 12 rabbits to value one life of a beaver. And I can't even imagine how this human economic system worked to impact food chains, alter the look, feel, and provisions of indigenous habitats, or perhaps even caused extra confusion, anxiety, and trauma, and resentment as their systems of coexistence were being tampered with from the outside. Thank you so much for that, Jill. Uh, I have another question for you both. Uh, we're going to start by wrapping. I think there's just a couple questions left, actually. Uh, we'll start by uh, wrapping by discussing something that you've both brought up, which is the idea that a huge part of Canada's exploration, colonization, and settler history is based on a fashion trend. Can you both talk a bit more about that? John, would you like to start this one? Well, I think it's important to note that fashion is um, something that all uh, societies uh, enjoy and it's a way of distinguishing yourself quite often status-wise as well as the practical aspect. So Canada started with this uh, coincidentally with this fur trade uh, in the 1600s and, uh, and that basically brought it like the heyday of it was 250 years bringing us almost right up to confederation. So it just laid the groundwork for confederation for the ability for politicians to come in after the fact and start you know, uh, network or stitching everything together to, to solidify this, this fur trading uh, area. But fashion wise, it also had an impact on indigenous people. Um, I'm, I have right here a blanket. So, you know, they would trade a beaver. I know, how many beaver pelts, Jill, for a blanket? You know, um, they uh would well, actually, uh, what I've read most recently is those little tiny, um, ticks on the bottom oh, the actually points. were to symbolize how many how many people it could cover so like a four a four ticks if there was four lines on a blanket it meant like it was a king size or something like that so oh, uh, i i had always i had always thought four lines meant four beavers but that's not the case <laughs> yeah so yeah the, the, the point blankets Actually, this isn't this isn't a point blanket. This one, but it is a it is a, a blanket that would have been traded. So um, yeah, so they traded beaver for for wool from Europe. You know, so basically, beaver was a form of wool. The undercoat was called beaver wool. To some people, it had little barbs like uh, sheep wool does, and so they would just trade that wool for sheep wool. And uh, out west, what happened was they had these uh, cowhitch and sweaters that would be knitted by these little dogs that were known for their fur. They had barbs as well. They could be knitted into these big couch and sweaters. Now, what we see today is these couch and sweaters are now made uh, you know, with sheep's wool because as soon as sheep's wool became available, it was less, it was more economic just to buy the wool from, from, the, uh, from the Hudson Bay Post than it would be to uh, harvest it from your own little dogs. Um, so um, those dogs eventually went extinct. So that, that's interesting how th those dogs became a, a casualty of uh, fashion. And, um, and the other thing too is that uh, this, this wool blanket uh, then uh, evolved uh, into the capote, which was kind of like a hooded garment like that. Um, they were then in the uh, War of 1812, which uh, uh, Aurelius first settler Antoine Godor was in. Uh, the first year that he was there, uh, they had invent this Métis couple uh, uh, invented the uh, Mackinac jacket. So that jacket uh, became part became part of the uh, wardrobe of the British forces, including the uh, the, the uh, uh, their enlisted voyageurs and Métis and, and uh, First Nation that went to fight against the Americans. It was a short jacket that became a fashion staple in many households for uh, uh, almost uh, two centuries. And uh, it's still, you can still buy these jackets around, around North America. They became a staple for both Canada and, and America. And, and I think 
if you look around the world, most people, you know, will recognize it as a North American garment because of the, the Buffalo check design, which started even back then. So, um, yeah, so the, the, it's all been about fashion and it, uh, and fashion does have changes and all it takes is a prince to wear a silk hat and then the fashion changes again. And then we have to find the new fashion, but you know, in, in global uh, manufacturing uh, with the, ma uh, the garment uh, industry, we know that uh, these garment industries are very price sensitive and they move around to different countries and exploit those countries. They, some countries benefit at the beginning, but, uh, but then after a while they realize these garment industries are exploitive and can have uh, economic uh, repercussions as well as, you know, in addition to the uh, benefits that they can provide. So um, I won't go into that in any more detail, but people can look up that up on the, uh, uh, the studies that have been done about the, uh, the role of uh, the internet. I think it's the IMF is involved in uh, funding these industries. Oh, thank you, so John. Much. Somebody just put in the chat that 25 pelts um, were, uh, it says to make a blanket, but I'm, I'm guessing that Joe and Lori meant to say exchange for a blanket. Yeah. That's so fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm, so, I'm also I supposed to talk about fashion? Yeah, if you want to talk about um, Canada's exploration, colonization, and settler histories based on a fashion trend, do you want to yeah, discuss okay. that a bit? Go ahead. Um, so for, uh, for this, I, I actually sort of um, just going to share some of the how, well, here's a, 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 a fantastic cartoon I found. Um, uh, I think it's actually an HBC, I found it on the HBC website, believe it or not. So um, obviously they have a sense of humor, maybe allowed to, able to outlock themselves, but on the left are examples of all the different felted hats um, that were that were being commissioned during those times. Uh, so, um, so yeah, the beaver was virtually extinct in Europe uh, due to the high demand for beaver felt tops. And so um, obviously the alternative source was found in North America. And uh, from the late 16th to mid 19th century, beaver top hats were an essential aspect of men's fashion across much of Europe. Not only were they extremely valuable, but often treated as a family heirloom. So they were passed on from their father to a son. And a hat's design also denoted an individual's societal status and occupation as, as seen on the left. Uh, there are several places within my exhibition that the works visually point to how fashion over the ages has led to the extension and expansion of the fur trade. Working with photos from the archive, I carefully, on the left, you can see I uh, worked with photos from the archive and carefully applied fur atop images that depicted people wearing fur as a coat, hat, trim, or other garments. Uh, on the right, the large installation entitled Family Tree also used stoles, hats, shawls, mittens, muffs to point to the more than human family networks that are disrupted, discontinued, or traumatized as a result of the fashion trends that have uh, happened over the years. And uh, some other small sculptures uh, in the exhibit um, point, also point to the fur trade and um, fashion. So fur, um, um, so on the left is a work entitled Stolen. And uh, the, the strip of mink fur is directly attached from the little mink sculpture's body and wrap, goes up and around the woman's neck. On the right, well, this installation piece is called Tailored. Um, and it also presents a tailless hair and coyote looking at one another in disbelief at how their fur has been used to decorate the hat and collar of a Champlain maquette, uh, also found in the Oma collection. And these two sculptures, uh, fur lined on the left and wolf in sheep's clothing on the right, also point to the importance of wool, which John touched on and during the fur trade. So wool was a desired material for its weight, readiness, flexibility, and use of color. 
um, the Hudson Bay blankets and coats. However, um, you know, what's come out of these stories more recently is how these coats and blankets unknowingly and eventually knowingly led to the spread of disease amongst many Indigenous communities. And so on the left, we see um, fur of animals erasing those signature colors of the HBC and reclaiming space atop the surface of the wool coat. And on the right, I use the wolf in sheep's clothing, a phrase that originates from Matthew 7:15, which says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves to suggest like the sermon that the true nature of the British colonizers eventually revealed themselves by their actions, the ultimate tricksters and predators. And then uh, other aspects of my exhibition that draw attention to fur and fashion is a, a performance video entitled Unleashed, in which I released the fur of a rabbit from the formation of a human cat. As I, near, uh, near the end of the deconstruction, you can see how many rabbit lives would have been required for the making of that hat. Additionally, the case below the television is host to a fur seal coat that had been handed down to me on my mother's side. As you can see from the chart on the left, it takes six baby seals to produce a seal coat. I also find it interesting that humans refer to both their coverings and that of an animal as a coat just like the heads and tails of coins point back to different forms of cattle being the first form of currency. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, there's, lo uh, there's lots of points within um, my exhibition that point to the, fa the fashion that determine the fur industry. Great, thank you, Jill. Uh, so we have run a little bit over time. We just have one question left for the two of you before we open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you this and unfortunately ask you to be brief. Uh, our last question is, is Canada the country that it is today if not for the fur trade? Uh, John, would you like to start? Um, okay. Well, I'm going to wear my reclaimed beaver's fur hat, bought in Tremblant, made in Montreal. Um, yeah, Canada today, uh, I think right from the beginning, we see that uh, government, big business, and uh, small business have all been competing right from the very beginning. Uh, governments try to control it, provide monopolies to uh, large corporations, uh, and then the small guys uh, come in and try and compete uh, on the margins as well. Um, Canada, in my opinion, is biased towards big business. We see that with the way our pension system is structured. Uh, you know, you have to be part of a union, either uh, with a big business union or maybe even the public service to get uh, proper health care and, and, uh, and a pension. Um, otherwise, you have to do it on your own. Uh, the other thing I notice is that uh, the values of land of the land have changed. The Indigenous saw themselves as in balance. This is getting hot. Um, in balance with nature and the ecology and their economic system was a sustainable economy of sorts, whereas the European was uh, saw themselves at the top of a pyramid and it was their human right to extract as much as they wanted and more from the land. And this trajectory, this value system trajectory we see to this day where uh, we've, been we've been exploiting our resources and mining, logging, Logging even today, old growth forests. Why are we doing that? Because we know old growth provides more, uh, uh, you know, oxygen into the air than the average uh, biomass for a tree uh, elsewhere. So, you know, it, 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 it's boggling the mind that we're still thinking in this, in this uh, resource extractive way. And, uh, and what we have to do as a society is because on this trajectory, you know, the future is on fire. We see it in the West. We see the, uh, the weather changing. We see the droughts. We're seeing the floods where I live. I've had two 200 year floods in just the last four years. And uh, so we have to start thinking more in balance. And you know, the indigenous people had a lot of things right. You know, our political systems, uh, even the United States constitution and the United Nations uh, are have elements of what indigenous societies uh, shared with the Europeans. So 
I think the last thing is we have to learn how to live uh, more compatibly with nature or else the natural economy will suppress the human uh, uh, economy. Great, thank you, John. Uh, and now Jill, over to you. Uh, is Canada the country it is today if not for the fair trade? Um, well, I would like to imagine, um, uh, I, I think I said, I, I've talked about this before, where I think that if it wasn't for the fur trade uh, constantly creeping in, as, as John said, that we might be a country of many countries. Uh, or We already are a nation of many nations, but we might look a lot more like Europe just because the vastness of, of Canada as a nation and the, the um, diversity of the geographies that lay within this giant land mass would suggest that we have several different uh, cultures uh, requiring different uh, needs and having different belief systems and values uh, all across the country. You know, we see that with our federal government, um, where how can they how can they possibly please? You know, the coast, the the prairies, the the maritimes, the rock, you know, and Ontario, and then Quebec. So, um, uh, but my but. Based, it, it, you know, ultimately we have colonial colonialism was around, and so if they weren't coming for the furs, they were coming for something else, and uh, uh, and and our forests would have been another perfect thing for them just to move across the country and extract, you know, not to mention oil. So, um, but yes, I, I think the fur trade has definitely put a unique stamp on on this this uh, how this nation was formed. It certainly has. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, we have asked an impossible task of you two to summarize in an hour what uh, university courses are taught on in a semester. So thank you both so much. Obviously, we know there's so much more that we could touch on and go into greater detail on, but you've done a, a marvelous job. So um, we are going to turn it over to the audience now for questions. Uh, we've had a couple come in. So um, please put them into the Q&A and we will make sure that John and Jill get to hear those. Um, stay, stay on for after the question and answer period where uh, Trish will be announcing some of the upcoming talks for the fall season. So uh, Tanya, do you want to lead off the questions? Sure. I'm going to start with um, Jill Price is going to answer this one live. Uh, how many animal parts and animal derivatives are incorporated in cosmetic products and clothing such as wool, cashmere, and clothing for women? This one's coming from Joe and Lori. I, I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that animal byproducts are, are used in, in many, many, many different things. Sorry, I have a dog uh, licking a bell here. Um, but actually, Joe, Joe and Lori answered their own question. <laughs> So they answered it in the chat. They said, beaver, mink, and martin oils are widely used in cosmetics, lotions, and moisturizer creams. Uh, and they also point to how animal cells were used in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. So um, uh, we, know, we know that, um, you know, the world uses a lot of uh, animal byproducts and that fur, um, you know, fur isn't the only reason why we are um, farming animals. Um, just one, and if, if anything, it's a very small percentage of, uh, of the animals being farmed in the world. I think it's 3%, only 3% of the animals being farmed are for fur. So, and I use, I do know that the byproducts from those fur farms go to other things. So, Jill, I did have a question for you. I know that you and I have discussed this, this exhibition and uh, um, a lot of the issues around it. Um, I wanted to talk to you about animal activism, because that's something, you know, important. Um, a group such as PETA, you know, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Um, can you talk a little bit about the impact of these groups? You know, um, is their impact net good or net negative, would you say? And do you- Oh, I, 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 I can't, I, I can't make a column, <laughs> but I would just, <laughs> I would just say that, um, these people help to raise consciousness about um, how we are treating the more than human beings that are 
um, you know, they are, they are nurturing, loving, thinking, feeling, uh, feeling beings. And, um, and on the other side, I have read how, you know, some activists uh, will actually release these animals from fur farms. And the, the result is actually they end up starving, starving to death, dehydration, more anxiety than when in the cages because they're not used to being uncaged. And so, um, um, you know, we always have the best intentions and, and sometimes they actually, they don't go so well. But uh, I think it really is, I, I do appreciate these people drawing attention to what's going on in these, these spaces so that we can make informed choices for ourselves. Um, I think one of the, you know, the issues today, um, I, I've become more and more uh, um, respectful of hunters and trappers in that if you have the, if you have the ability to trap and kill an animal and skin it and, and eat that, to me, there's no distance between you and what you're eating and what you're wearing. You're willing to take that on for yourself. Whereas the majority of us are eating from supermarkets and we never see a claw, we never see a foot, and we never see an eyeball. And so, um, uh, but, but we can make, still make informed decisions um, about who we're buying from, uh, you know, if we're buying for far, farm fur, or if we're buying wild fur, like we still can make our own choices for ourselves just in these people helping to raise awareness. And I, I have noticed lately too, a, a new, not that I'm all about um, restaurant trends, but I have noticed that there is the head to tail trend where chefs are now trying to use complete yeah. parts of an animal if it's slaughtered, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We have a question here for John uh, from Joe and Lori. John, did the Indigenous people benefit from the fur trade or did they suffer? I think it's fair to say both because uh, they benefited from the standpoint they got access to practical tools and uh, other items, um, but they didn't benefit from the standpoint that it affected their uh, previous uh, sustainable living. And uh, like I said before, uh, because they were hunting, focusing so much on, on uh, the fur trade, they were spending less time trying to uh, hunt for uh, sustaining themselves. So they were prone to famine. And, uh, and then they were also prone to uh, infections from the diseases that the Europeans brought. Uh, we see later as the fur train w trade waned uh, that the, uh, their labor was no longer needed in the fur trade and, and less needed as more and more settlers came to do the jobs that the uh, clone colonial uh, settlers wanted to have done. So they became almost like superfluous labor, uh, it seems, and uh, sadly, and uh, they were sidelined by the Indian Act as well. Uh, so that completed uh, uh, the uh, abrogation of the relationship, the partnership that had always been part of the land. Um, and I must say it wasn't the people that betrayed them in the end may not have even been the people that first arrived here. They may have been the newcomers, the people that didn't understand the, the close relationship that Europeans had with the indigenous people at the beginning. The newcomers didn't understand it. They were willfully ignorant of it. And, uh, and, and the establishment didn't see a need to even uh, educate them on uh, the rights of indigenous people. So that ends up with the residential school system you know, where, you know, uh, something that was well intended to inform uh, Indigenous people on how to participate in the economy uh, actually backfired and became uh, a way of abusing Indigenous people and in trying to erase their culture. Uh, so, you know, today uh, I worked with the Indian uh, Residential School Settlement uh, Program, uh, and I can say as a witness to all the evidence that's coming out today. Yes, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't nice. We even see it in the way the federal government uh, has failed in many ways, in many respects to integrate indigenous people, even into the public service um, uh, properly. So yeah, I wouldn't say the indigenous people gained a lot. They were separated from their 
uh, they gained a little bit during their lifetimes, but uh, their, their, um, their people have lost a lot. They've been separated from their land, their resources and their, and their wealth. And they've been shut out of the, uh, out of the, sh of the shared opportunity. And it's up to this generation as children of the fur trade to, uh, uh, to try and restore that once again. No, thank you for that, John. I do have another question. We just got one in the, the Q&A, and it was actually kind of a similar to a question that I had. Um, my question was going to be, you know, Jill, you showed us that image of the fur trading floor and all those furs going to people, but I don't see people walking around with giant fur coats as often anymore. Um, so Liz Avison has asked, you know, what impact will there be um, on Canada be uh, of Canada Goose and Holt Renfrew discontinuing the use and, and trade in first because we actually had talked about that how they're often now they're taking off those collars right they're stopping that so where are all these furs going you know that if people aren't wearing them anymore where do the furs go well even without Canada Goose and uh, uh, I didn't realize Holt Renfrew had just announced something but uh almost all of our furs go to China. Um, um, there's a real demand there. Um, they have a, uh, an increasing middle upper class um, there and they, they're demanding um, these, these items for their fashion as well as the majority of the um, fabrication of the furs into coats um, is being produced there as well and exported from there. So. Um, there isn't an overly huge uh, demand in Canada per se, but um, and I'm not sure if um, these t these two uh, distributors or, or designers are going to impact the Canada fur trade that much. Um, if anything, um, I feel like what happened on the west coast with COVID also infecting some of the fur farms out there. And um, other countries starting to do away with their fur farms that we might not see Canada uh, move more in that direction. Um, uh, and something that's also come to light from my research is that almost a lot of fur farms across Canada, like the oil industry, are being subsidized um, in that they have seen losses. Uh, for, for various reasons uh, over the years. And so there was one farm, I think, in Nova Scotia that's received 4.2 million in the last like five years to subsidize. So I, I feel like um, if th these things come to light <laughs> and our, our, our government's held accountable, then uh, we might see, we might see the part of that system collapse. But I, I think the right part of the system, you know, I, I, as I said, I have a real respect for those who do wild hunting and trapping, so. Great, thank you, Jill. So uh, we have time for just this last question before we wrap up, uh, and this is to John. Um, the question is, Antoine Godor is portrayed as an ex-fur trader. Why would he leave if the fur trade was so lucrative? Sorry, sorry can you say that again? For sure. Okay, I'll yeah. turn on the air conditioner. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Antoine Godor is portrayed as an ex-fur trader, and why would he leave the fur trade if it was so lucrative? Do you know why that is? Um, well, I think he just got old. Um, you know, he lived a, a fairly long life, um, but uh, by the I think towards the end, uh, the fur trade was uh, starting to decline in the area, probably because of the habitat destruction of logging, which is another exhibit, I guess we could <laughs> get into it. <laughs> but the, yeah, the logging in the area was starting to take off and uh, that's probably, and, and the furs were probably well tapped out by the time they were wrapping up operations. And I'm not sure exactly when they wrapped up, uh, wrapped up operations because um, Francis Godor actually uh, was given uh, by his hunting uh, clients uh, the old fur trading post at the, uh, I think it was on Creighton Street uh, at, at the Narrows, which uh, Frank Keogh 
uh, you know, uh, uh, grew up in, and in which my great grandfather had a taxidermy shop in the back before it burned down, thanks to Frank. But anyway, I'll <laughs> let Frank explain that later. I think he tipped over a candle or something, and his his mom fled the house, and then the whole thing went up in smoke. But uh, anyway, that's that's right there, uh, down by uh, the Jacob Orr Bridge, uh, across from the ANW. Uh, that vacant piece of land there. Cool. All right, so we are out of time for questions. Um, we are going to turn things over now to Trish to wrap it up for us. Okay, thanks a lot, Lindsay. Um, on behalf of the uh, History Committee and OMA, I want to first of all thank uh, John and Jill as well for being our guest panelists tonight and providing their perspectives on a very thought-provoking topic. I also want to thank uh, Lindsay and Tanya for uh, co-hosting uh, this uh, different type of format for our speaker series in the Q&A format. And I'd like to say thank you to all those in attendance tonight. As always, your ongoing support is very much appreciated. Um, and as of previous talks, we're going to have this uh, presentation available on YouTube. And just to note that in the OMA gift shop, we have some uh, fur clad pieces of original art and figurine, figurines that uh, Jill has created. And please note that all these items are made from reclaimed fur, as are the teddy bears and pillows that are also available in the shop by artist Jane Forrest. So for our speaker series, um, we will take a hiatus over the rest of the summer, uh, but we'll be back in September and we have more exciting presentations uh, to share with you. So on September 15th, we have Dr. Chris Decker, who's going to present Dr. Norman Bethune, Communist, humanitarian, innovator, and Muskokan. Uh, Bethune's home is in Gravenhurst and it's a national historic site. And to this day, he's considered a hero in the People's Republic of China. So learn more about his life and times of this remarkable man. In October, um, the History Committee's own uh, Fred Kalin will present Alfred Nobel and the Canadian Nobel Prize winners. There are currently 24 Canadian winners of the Nobel Prizes including one winner from Simcoe County. So join us and find out who they were and why each of them won the Nobel Prize. Then on November 17th, we are going to host our annual Carmichael Art History Lecture Fundraiser. And this event is held annually to honor the group of seven artists, Franklin Carmichael, who was born and raised here in Aurelia. And our guest speaker is going to be Dr. Anna Hudson, who's a professor of York University um, an art historian and a former associate curator of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And her talk will be Depression Era and Wartime Art and Social Consciousness, uh, the legacy of the Group of Seven. So uh, plenty of uh, events happening, so stay tuned. In, and in the near future, there'll be information sent on how you can register. So thanks again to John and Jill and thank all of you and enjoy the rest of your summer and we'll see you in September. Bye everyone. Thank <laughs> you.